What's up everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and this is where we review speakers, we talk about what we hear, and we talk about the science and the data behind the measurements and try to correlate those two so you can become a better shopper, better informed as to what you buy and the specs behind what you're buying and how they matter. Today I have the Kef R3 speakers behind me. These are bookshelf speakers. They come in a variety of colors, uh, black, there's some kind of like wood grain color, and I think white as well. They retail for $2,000 per pair. This speaker is a three-way design. It features a six and a half inch mid-bass. It features a five and a quarter inch coaxial concentric drive unit. And what I mean there is typically coaxial drivers are ones that have a tweeter placed in line with the mid-range. And the difference between coaxial and concentric is concentric is usually coined to mean that the tweeter and the mid-range share the same point in space for their acoustic center. So they fire at the exact same point in time and there is no latency between you know, the tweeter being in front and the mid-range being behind it like you would typically have with a coaxial driver. Now, I did a, what did I call it, before the review session on this particular speaker about two months ago before I actually had the chance to do all the measurements and all the actual review like I'm doing now. If you want to go back and hear a little bit more about that speaker, you certainly can. It'll put it up in one of these corners. I never know which way it's supposed to go, but it'll go in one of these corners at about this point in time. Just click that, follow it. I talk more about the specific speaker itself. Gosh, I almost tripped over my words. The specific speaker itself, some of the highlights behind it, how the concentric design works, how the shadow flare of the concentric design helps to provide a better dispersion pattern and control the response in a well-maintained way so you don't get a lot of aberrations in the response itself. Now in this review, I'm gonna discuss my subjective hearings up front and then I'll talk about the objective. And this is gonna be a long review. Pretty much all of my reviews are gonna be kind of long and that's because when I get into the objective data, it takes me a while to talk through it. I can't just throw a couple graphs up there and say, okay, we're done because that wouldn't provide any service to my viewership, you. I want to provide some data and I want to provide some explanation about what the data means. But I know a lot of people only want one thing or the other, so I will add timestamps and you can just click those and go to the section you want. Otherwise, buckle up, enjoy the ride, and let's start doing this. Starting off with this objective, the KEF concentric design, in my experience, has always lent itself to providing a very good soundstage. And when I talk soundstage, what I mean is the space of the recording. Now that's going to vary from recording to recording because some recordings have space kind of built into them. Some recordings do not. If you make electronic music, it's probably not going to have any sense of space built into it. But if you record in a big hall and you have microphones placed at different locations within the area and you have, you know, a celloist over here, or a drummer over there, a guitarist way back there, you know, a singer way up front. That helps provide a good sense of space if it's mixed correctly and in a way that provides you that sense of space. So the KEF concentric design has always, in my experience, again, provided a good, I don't know if I want to call it realistic sense of space because honestly, I wasn't there when they, when they made the album and they recorded it, but I would consider it probably close to realistic. And the thing about the KEFs that are different from other speakers is that the KEFs don't necessarily get wide. So the soundstage, the width on them isn't very, very wide. And generally speaking, I like a wider soundstage. I like reflections off the sidewall to provide more sense of space in the recording. But often that kind of comes at a cost because you have a wide soundstage, but the depth isn't quite there. It's, it's not quite as layered as it is wide. And you may have experienced that too in some of your speakers listening. And if you have, I would be curious to know what speakers you have that kind of fit that uh, description. The thing about these KEFs is that they are layered. And even though they aren't terribly wide, the sound stage is what I would consider probably more symmetric than most other speakers that I've heard. Let's say for instance, and I'm just pulling numbers out of the air, let's say that they are placed eight feet apart. I'm making up numbers and then they go outside of the physical placement by about three feet. So that's eight plus six, so that's what, 14 feet? So you get 14 feet sideways. Most speakers may not have the depth that encompasses that kind of sense of space, you know, assuming that all things are equal. They may only go, you know, oh, 10 feet or six feet or something in depth, but the KEFs 
just seem to be very symmetric where they might go 14 feet wide, they might go 14 feet deep, again, if the recording calls for it. And that's what I really, really like about the Kef sound. They have that real good signature about them that provides a lot of layering in the sound stage. So, you know, person will be up here, a instrument will be back here, things are off to the side over here, things are over here, up, but a little bit close up front. And when I say up front, that's the other thing too. There's a lot of speakers that can present themselves as having a layered soundstage, but often what that is, is that's a discrepancy in the radiation pattern. So the radiation pattern may be broad at one frequency, but narrow at another. And that often provides you, to some people at least, a sense of layering. But when you understand what you're really listening for, you begin to realize that that's really a discontinuity in the soundstage, and that's not a good thing. But with the KEFs, you don't have that issue. It's broad when it needs to be broad, and if the recording calls for it to be narrow, it's narrow, and that stays throughout because they have good control directivity above about, I don't know, four or 500 hertz, and we'll talk about more of that when we get into the data. The good thing about the concentric design also is that the tweeter is placed within the mid-range. That provides the height sensation without the lobing effect, and what I mean lobing is if you got one tweeter placed up here and then you got a mid-range placed down here, if the crossover isn't designed quite right, you'll have a lobing effect where the sound kind of comes out forward right at you and then it sucks back in. So just think of like a sideways teardrop, right? And that would kind of be what a lobing effect does. It kind of goes out and goes out and kind of comes back in. A bad crossover design typically has that and it's hard to get away from lobing effects if you want output in SPL terms, normally that requires, you know, providing extra drive units and then you have to worry about your crossover even more. The thing about a good concentric design is that with the tweeter placed within the mid range, you don't really have any offset. You don't have that offset vertically and you definitely don't have that offset um, uh, laterally. I don't know, this way, turn sideways. So that means that you're free to kind of have more space to move around in. And while the ideal axis is typically aimed at the tweeter, you can sit above it or below it and basically get the same sound because the tonality isn't drastically different as you move above or below. Now I'm not talking go stand behind it or stand directly above it, but within reason. So that's the thing that I really like about the concentric designs of KEFs. And, and some people may disagree. They may say that, you know, that's hokum and that's what your uh, intuitive nature would want you to believe. I've seen people say that kind of thing because they expect that that's you know marketing jargon, but to me it's not. I've been doing this for a long time. I actually had these, not these same drive units, but similar drive units in my car. And every time that I've used KEF drive units, even in DIY designs, which I've actually built home towers out of KEF drive units before, I've always had that really great layering of the soundstage. They just do that really, really well. They do it better, I think, than any other speaker that I've heard to date. So that's the good thing about a concentric. What's the bad thing? Well, just generally speaking, SPL seems to be a trade-off. When you have a drive unit, a mid-range, a five and a quarter inch mid-range, and you take the center of it out and put a tweeter in, then you lose surface area, right? Naturally, it just makes sense, right? So start with a five and a quarter inch surface area, you know, whatever that is squared. Then you go to effectively like three inch or three and a half inch diameter. And then so you can see how you kind of lose surface area there because you're just cutting the middle of it out, placing a tweeter in that location. And that typically lowers the sensitivity of the drive unit, but you know, with these particular designs, they're able to keep the sensitivity at about a, a medium spot. I, I wanna say that these spec out somewhere in the 86 dB at one meter range, which is reasonable you know, for a typical bookshelf. And then when you step up to the higher lines, I'm guessing that their sensitivity increases a little bit more too. The other thing you've gotta be careful of is the excursion of the mid-range because the mid-range is effectively a waveguide for the tweeter. The design is as such that the tweeter lines up with the mid-range and then it just helps guide out the sound. So as you can imagine, if you push the mid-range forward, that creates kind of a jagged transition from the tweeter to the mid-range. If you push it inward, that creates a step. So ideally what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna drive the mid-range too, too hard and or you wanna have a good crossover to limit its excursion, which these do that. So I didn't notice any kind of modulation factors, which I've done a test on before, and if I can find it, I'll link it. But I didn't notice any kind of modulation factors because of the mid-range, you know, going in and out while I'm listening to high frequencies and thus causing issues with high frequency modulation. I didn't notice that in these particular speakers.
Now that's some of the, the tech behind these speakers. And again, if you wanna go watch my other video, there's more involved into that. What I wanna do now is just kinda of go ahead and jump into more of the subjective notes that I have, which I took on my phone here. So I'm just gonna kinda of read it off to you as I go. The listening position from the couch to the speakers was about 3.9 meters. And then the speakers were placed 1.2 meters from the wall. Now these were run full range, no crossover, so 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And something I wanna note, Right now I'm in my living room. When I first got these, I took these up to my home theater. My home theater is purposely built for, you know, JBL pros. They're built into a false wall and that false wall has all sorts of sound absorption on it so I could have the speakers hidden behind the screen and not have the effect of the sound bouncing off the screen and coming back into the speaker and causing, you know, issues with comb filtering or anything like that. So truthfully, my home theater probably is not the ideal place to test speakers unless I'm really going to just gut out that whole wall. So I've gotten to where I just started testing speakers down here because I feel like it's more, it's more fair for every speaker that I test. But with that said, when I listened to these upstairs of my home theater, I did not like them at all. I just, I was really underwhelmed. I was not impressed. The bass did not sound right. The, the sound stage just was, I don't know, um, not there. It was just not impressive. And the tonality was okay, but there was just nothing that made me feel like these are good accurate speakers but then i brought them down here and i listened again and it really and truly was like a totally different speaker and that's the first speaker that i've had interact in that kind of manner now i've always had the other speakers you know behave differently and like i said the upstairs room is not ideal for you know demoing speakers but i like to do that to give me different placements and, and different ideas of how speakers will sound in different environments this was the first speaker that really reacted to the different environments in a, in a drastic way. And I would say just kind of two things, I guess. One is I think that the modes, the room modes in my room upstairs were not permissive to bass output because there was just no bass. But when I brought them down here, there was plenty of kick. There was good 60 hertz and good 80 hertz. So there's good kick. And then the harmonics of the kicks carried over too, which I, I really like down here. And then the other thing, like I said, the soundstage down here is not very, very wide because these speakers don't really tend to lend themselves to wide soundstage, but it was nice and it was there and the soundstage was layered, but upstairs it was not that way. And I'm thinking, you know, upstairs is just too dead for maybe just any speaker. But again, these speakers really seem to be dependent upon the proper room. So in my personal opinion and my recommendation, I would not... I wouldn't add any absorption to your walls. I would listen to these first before you decide to just go hang in absorption panels. I don't think that they're really what you want to do there. So keep that in mind. Easy Lover by Phil Collins and Philip Bailey. Uh, I noticed that it had a very deep soundstage right in the middle during the breakdown of the song. So around the three minute mark, just very luscious and deep uh, soundstage with this. And it, and it layered forward and backwards, which I'll get to a little bit more later uh I, I wrote sharp around one to two kilohertz at above 90 db and i actually noticed this on a few different songs and when i say sharp there was a specific frequency that just like it made me go oh i don't like that and i had to turn the volume down and it only really turned its head when i got above 90 db and again this is about four meters away so that's a pretty hefty listening distance and and a pretty hefty volume I wound up getting the RTA out and I listened again and I, I nailed it down to about 2.5 kilohertz. Now, I can't tell you that if it's my room or if it's the speaker and I looked at the data, there's nothing in the data to insinuate that it's the speaker itself. But I'd be curious to know if anybody else has heard that issue as well. Um, my RTA measurements, which I'll show in the data as well, I don't believe that it showed anything, but I could be mistaken. So I'll have to get to that in a little bit. Uh, the Chain by Fleetwood Mac. Now, if you've listened to this song, you know that there's a lot of things going on. There's a guitar. I think it's on your right, my left. Um, very, very deep kick drum in the soundstage. It's very, very deep. And it can extend way, way back, depending on how good your speakers are rendering layering of a soundstage. And in this particular case, these speakers did a great job of that. And that was one of my favorite things about these speakers is just the layering of the soundstage. Um, and again, they did that without sounding forward, you know, so they didn't have any kind of bite to them that kind of leapt out at you from radiation pattern discontinuities, you know, as you're going wide and then you go narrow and go wide again or something like that near the crossover. These speakers don't have that. That's a testament to the concentric design. Uh, Free Fallen by John Mayer. So that's a Tom Petty song that John Mayer covered, which I believe is on Where the Light Is. 
And if you guys haven't heard that, I really and truly recommend you listen to it. It is a great song, a great acoustic album. I think the album is like the first six songs are all acoustic, and then the rest are not acoustic, but it's a, it's a concert album. Uh, I wrote very nice tonal mid-range quality with good air in his vocal as he breathes. And there's another thing, too, that you can hear audience members say things in the background. And if you just listen for it, you can pick up little details like that. And that's really cool. Uh, it's not just that these speakers did that, but these speakers do do that as well as other speakers I've heard. And it's just a cool track. Um, I wrote Nice Hi-Hat on PYT by Michael Jackson. And then I said it sounded a bit forward with some sounds, uh, with the ch sounds. So that ch was kind of coming out. And I wrote 3K with a question mark. And that might have been that same 2.5K that I mentioned earlier. So the ch sounds seemed to kind of come out at you a little bit. And again, I don't know if that's room or if it's speaker. Uh, speakers didn't, the data doesn't show that it's in the speaker, so it could be the room, but we'll see if we can find that later. Uh, let's see here. Nice kick drum harmonics. So when I say the harmonics of the kick drum, kick drums are usually 50, 50 to 60 hertz. That's where the meat, you know, the fundamental of a kick drum is, but the harmonics are what kind of gives it that, um, gives it the different weights, you know? So if you have a, a null in the 100 hertz and above region, but you have a strong peak at 80 hertz and or 60 hertz, you might get a strong kick drum, but it's just, it's it's a thud. It's just like a, and that's it. You don't really get any life out of that kick drum, any of the any of the, the tangible, I guess, sound to it. And you'd really do that with these speakers, especially in this room. Upstairs, I didn't hear that at all, but downstairs in my living room is great. Uh, double bass on Def Leppard photographs is nice. Uh, but it could use more 60 hertz. So I'm thinking that that's just part of the roll off. So I noted that the harmonics of the kicks were great, but the fundamental of the kick maybe needs a little bit more, but these are bookshelf speakers and you know, I mean, they're bookshelf speakers. After listening to these speakers full range from 20 hertz, to 20 kilohertz, I decided, okay, now what do these sound like with a subwoofer? So I've got currently two SVS subwoofers on hand. I've got the SB2000 Pro and the SB3000. And I brought both of them in here. I set them up with the RTA. I used my app. And let's just kind of go from the SB3000 perspective here. I'm using the Parasound NT200 integrated amplifier. And for that, I'm feeding, you know, Apple TV and different USB signals and stuff like that. But it's got 110 watts at four or eight ohm. And it did a great job powering these speakers. So if you're looking for something that kind of is an all-in-one solution, I really would recommend that. I'm going to do a review on it soon. I've been very, very happy with it. And I actually requested to review it because I wanted to pair it with these speakers because I thought, what's a good, you know, semi-budget audiophile setup? And I thought the Parasound and these speakers would probably be a good way to could kind of get into the game. But going the extra step and buying a good subwoofer like one of these SBS subwoofers that I was using, that really is just, it's a different ball game altogether. There's more weight in the lower frequencies. And I wound up just getting away with using two EQ bands uh, I can't remember the frequencies, but they were modal issues, and I tamed those down, and the whole system just, man, it came to life. It was it was night and day. And again, while I can't really fault the Kef speakers for not going down low, I think that if you're really wanting to entry to a hi-fi system, then buy these, but get a subwoofer too. I wouldn't recommend listening to these without a subwoofer. Maybe if you're starting out, you know, you can and then save up a little bit of money and get a subwoofer. But you're going to want a subwoofer eventually because, like I said, below 70 hertz or so is kind of where they start to roll off. And room gain helps you, but it doesn't help you enough. So that's just my, my advice. I would definitely add a subwoofer to these speakers. And I think when you do, you'll be pleasantly, pleasantly surprised and happy with that decision. And for what it's worth, I'm going to throw some Amazon affiliate links out there. That's how I generate some income to help me pay for the other stuff that I have to buy in order to test it for this channel on my website. So if you're interested in buying those kind of things, just check my affiliate links. And it doesn't cost you any more money, but it helps me with like a 4% commission. And over time, that helps to add up to where I can pay for other things. So just throwing that out there and letting you guys know, being upfront with that. That's going to do it for this objective. Now I want to talk about the objective data. So let's go into my computer room. We are at my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com. I will throw up a link to this review in the description below. Let's go ahead and get through some of this. A bunch of pictures. You're more than welcome to go through and check those out and read them if you want to. But let's go ahead and get to the data. But first of all, here's a picture of the setup in my garage. And I'll throw in a video and time lapse it right here. And 
as you can see, the speaker has been measured on my Clipple near field scanner. Now we get into the data. So if you go to my website and you see the CTA 2034 Spinorama data, you can actually click this little down arrow and this will tell you what each of these lines in this data means. You're more than welcome to do that. But for now, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit quickly and talk about the on-axis response. So the on-axis is in the black. And let me see if I can blow this up just a touch. There we go. What we see here is a uh, roll off below about 120 Hertz and then a steeper roll off. This must be where the vent comes in because it's, it's kind of typical to see this kind of response for a vented enclosure. But you can see that the speaker sensitivity averages around 86 dB to 87 dB, just kind of somewhere in that ballpark. I'm not seeing any major resonances in the on axis or off axis response. And overall, it looks pretty good. The only area that kind of caused me to go, huh, was above about the what is this three or four kilohertz and you see kind of a rise in the response now my guess is that that may be just due from the horn loaded nature of the tweeter and then the dip that back down is just going to be the crossover uh it may not be i'm not sure but that's just kind of my guess and then you see this little peak here so i'm not sure exactly again what causes this the, the concentric nature of these drive units don't make them quite easy to identify particular issues because i don't know all the intricacies of them and their tangerine waveguide. But I will say that, you know, if you're looking at this as a, as a peak, it's a relatively mild peak and it's about maybe one DB above the, the average in this region and about two DB above the overall average. So I don't know that anybody is going to, you know, catch that and it's going to sound bad to them. But if you go and look at the listening window response, which is in the green, now that is, and we can look at this, Listening window is an average of plus or minus 10, plus or minus 30 horizontally, and plus or minus 10 vertically. You can see that that peak kind of smooths back out, and overall the response is pretty good. You know, this area right here is somewhere in the crossover region, which honestly I don't recall what the actual crossover point is for these speakers, but just looking at the directivity indices right here kind of leads me to believe that it's somewhere in this two to, to four kilohertz region. And I say that because Right here, as you're losing or as you're increasing in value for directivity, that means your your sound stage or your radiation pattern is becoming more narrow. And then when you dip back down, that means you're getting wide again. So something is going from narrow to more omnidirectional. And that's usually because you're mating from like a, a mid-range to a tweeter. Now, remember, this is a three-way design. And the crossover for the three-way from the mid-bass to the uh, mid-range I think is around 500 Hertz. I'd have to double check that. But regardless, you're not seeing any kind of drastic change between the directivity pattern of the mid bass to the mid range. You're just not seeing kind of any change here in this region. So that leads me to believe that that directivity is, is handled quite well. And I would say that the directivity of the mid range to tweeter is handled pretty well. Although I honestly, I would expect it to be better. So I would be curious, you know, why there's a limitation in regards to this. Now keep in mind that this is all relative to the listening window. So this is the early reflection compared to the listening window for this blue down here. And then for this red down here, it is the sound power in this dashed red relative to the listening window. So that's how these are, are taken and how they're measured. And I'm not so much sure that it maybe is the dip as much as it's kind of the, the peak here. So I don't know, it just depends on how you're looking at it. And I would be curious to know if anybody's got some, some thoughts there. Now we're gonna get into the early reflections breakout. So the early reflections here in blue is simply broken out into the different components here. And if you wanna read about those, you can. Floor bounce, ceiling bounce, front wall, side wall, and rear wall bounce are all listed there. And for what it's worth, all of that information comes from this link. And that is the CTA 2034 specification, which you can download for free, no cost. And in the early reflections breakout, I'm just gonna focus on the green for now. And I'm not seeing anything that stands out to me as a problem. Uh, overall, all the reflections look pretty good. There's no major dips off axis uh, or that are shown to be off axis via these measurements. And so now we're gonna to skip to the estimated in-room response. Now, I have a explanation for this here, but essentially what this is, is this takes all the spin data, all the, the measurement points on and off axis, boils them down into an estimation for how the speaker is going to perform in your room. And that's a great thing because then you don't have to go out and buy a speaker. You can actually take anechoic good, anechoic data, get this prediction and determine if a speaker is going to kind of be more to your liking in your particular room because everybody has, you know, a certain preference 
and and that's fine. So be it. There, there's, there isn't necessarily a perfect speaker out there. Everybody seems to want a little bit something different here or there, a little bit of flavor. But ideally, what you want is a speaker that reacts well on and off axis, and then you can tweak it to your liking if you'd like. So we're going to come back to this. Now, SPL Horizontal, I'm providing the different colorways here are showing you the on and off axis response. And the thing that I noticed here is that if you're on axis, this red mark or this maroon red, this darker red, as we talked about earlier, it's got a little bit of a, a rise in the high frequency range, which could come off as bright to some, depending on you know what your what your preference is. But if you were to tow these speakers out about 10 or 20 degrees, you know, maybe toward the wall, not facing the wall, but out that direction, or you could even crossfire them if you wanted to try doing that. That high frequency dips down. And I will say that in general, I've noticed that. On axis listening for concentric drivers isn't usually the best. Generally, I find that about 10 degrees off axis is kind of the best way to go. Um, but I measured it based on the zero degrees axis because I believe that's the manufacturer's recommendation here. But it's just interesting to note that if you were to tow them in or out a little bit, then you can smooth that down. But that's going to come up with other trade-offs as well. So I recommend trying it. See what you think. Vertical response. Typically, what you see are some dips as you go off axis. But you're not seeing that here. Why? Same reason you didn't see it here. It's because it's a concentric driver. Tweeter has made it right next to the mid-range or right inside the mid-range. And the sound radiation point source is, it, it is a point source. It's all basically coming from the exact same point in space. And therefore, you don't get any drastic dips or anything like that as you go off axis relative to your on axis response. And I think that is a great and neat design. Um, no, it's just pretty cool. Pretty cool to see that in the data. So here are some contour plots and these are just colorized versions of kind of what I'm showing here you know it's just taking the different off-axis responses and putting that into some kind of color way for you to view relative to the angle on the left so frequency by angle and then the SPL is is color-coded here and what we're seeing here is this speaker is omnidirectional below 200 Hertz as you get to 200 Hertz it's about plus or minus 70 degrees and then it narrows up to about maybe plus or minus 30, and this is all at the higher output levels. And if you just talk about in terms of relative output, so if you want to go to the negative six, which many people do, then that actually says that your response is closer to about plus or minus 70 degrees, uh, 70 or 80 at one kilohertz. And then as you go to 10 kilohertz, it narrows down to about plus or minus 40. I'm just kind of eyeballing relative to this left axis. Uh, the, the thing here is that we're not seeing any major peaks or dips in the crossover region. I mean, you're seeing a dip here, but there's no major one like I've seen in many other lesser performing speakers. And then we go and look at the vertical contour plot. Now this should be very, very similar to the horizontal, except for you do have to count for the mid base, which is below the speaker. So there's gonna be some kind of discontinuity there as well, but it's really not, it's not severe that I'm seeing here. I do kind of wonder what's going on with this area. And I'm wondering if maybe there's some kind of like high lobing, but that's so high in frequency that I can't think, I can't imagine that that's from the mid base. Uh, maybe wonder if it's from the cabinet itself, some kind of diffraction effect. I'm not sure. It's just, it's just interesting. So I'm not gonna pretend like I know what it's from. I just find it interesting. And then this is the normalized response for the vertical contour. And again, we see, you know, kind of a notch out there, but it's not bad. It's actually pretty darn good uh, overall. But this information is kind of telling you that the sound radiation pattern isn't really really wide and what i mean by that is some speakers that i've had like the revel f226 be and and then some of like the ribbon type tweeters are at plus or minus uh 70 degrees in the horizontal axis and these are closer to closer to plus or minus you know it depends on what frequency you're at but maybe 40 to 50 you know just depending on where you're looking at maybe even 30 and the higher frequencies. And that's interesting. And what that means is you're going to get less room interaction. Some people may like that. And that may be a preference that you have. I prefer usually to have more room interaction from the side walls, uh, just because it provides you more apparent source width, which is what I talked about earlier. But that really is just a preference thing. And to me, that really is where the uh, separation from for preference arrives. So you can take two very perfect speakers, and you can cause them to have different directivity pattern, or not directivity pattern, but radiation patterns as far as width goes. And people might prefer one over the other. So that's just kind of, kind of food for thought. And we're gonna get down here, near field response. So the, the key takeaway here is that 
Well, first of all, I do near field response measurements to find errors in the response of the drive units themselves. But the key takeaway for me is in the port. Usually you see some kind of resonance, some high SPL resonance in the port. Uh, and it's in the mid-range area. And that shows up in frequency response. But a lot of people don't have the ability to measure frequency response and the kind of resolution that you need to see mid-range resonances. So the standard gated three to five millisecond responses that you see a lot of magazines and uh, other reviewers doing. And I'm not knocking them. It's just this is the science of it. This is the truth of it. They don't have the resolution to show uh, mid-range resonances, but with the Clipple, we have that. And we're not seeing any of that because the port doesn't cause anything. And that's a testament to their flexes or flexible port technology from CAF. And what this is, is it, I don't know what material it is, but basically the port isn't just a plastic tube or a cardboard tube. It's kind of like a rubberized material. You can actually put your fingers inside and squish it down. You can move it. And that I'm, I'm sure has something to do with why you don't have port resonance. So this isn't just marketing jargon. This is actual science, you know, and it works. So that's cool. Harmonic distortion, 86 dB is really quite low, uh, well below 1%, which would be the negative 40 uh, until you go in the, in the low base. And then at 96 dB at one meter, it's still well below 1% for the majority of the response until again, you get into the lower base regions. But to me, this is reasonable for a six and a half inch mid base in a vented enclosure. And I would even say that if you're going to wind up using a subwoofer, like I recommend, then this doesn't matter. That's going to go away because you're going to high pass it and not have those issues. And these are glow plots. This is very similar to the plots that we looked at up here. It's just a different way of looking at it. I prefer these because they're intuitive to me. So this is a top down view of the horizontal response. So you're taking a bird's eye view, looking directly down the top of the speaker. The zero degrees would be the front of the speaker. 180 would be the back and to the sides, left and right, plus or minus 90. And what this shows me is that the response uh, radiation pattern is about plus or minus 50 horizontally, uh, well down to 200 Hertz and out to, what is that? About 500, uh, 800 Hertz or so. You are still pretty wide. Uh, you're, you're well over plus or minus 90 degrees. So that's interesting to note. And again, if I were to pull up one of my other speaker measurements, you would see that some of those other speakers that I measured have gone out to plus or minus 70. So that's kind of where I talk about the room effects coming into play. So if you don't want the room to have a whole lot of involvement, this is more to your liking. If you do want a lot of involvement, then you would want a speaker that has wider uh, radiation. And then this is the vertical radiation. And again, this is zero degrees is pointing toward the front and 180 is toward the back, 90 is top, and then minus 90 is the bottom. And what we can see from here is vertically speaking, there is a pretty wide radiation window of about plus or minus 40 degrees, I would say. Uh, and then, you know, some spots are going a little bit above and below that, but there's no real issues here with the um, mating of the mid range to the tweeter. And because I'm just not seeing like major uh, discontinuities here in these, in these different colors. And then the shadow flare. So this is something that's pretty important. I think if you own the calf or if you're going to buy this calf, you need to keep this in mind. So when the calf leaves the factory, the shadow flare, which is this trim ring that goes around the drive unit, it is supposed to be pressed all the way in via shipment. We've learned that we, you know, the community has learned that they, they tend to kind of work their way out a little bit. And what we found is people have taken in-room response measurements and shown a dip around one kilohertz. So I did some investigation because I knew that there shouldn't be a dip there. Um, and thanks to a couple of guys on uh, Audio Science Review and, and Napier Lopez, for one, I'll shout you out because I appreciate you pointing this out to me as well. Uh, those guys were the inspiration for me to do this little investigation, if you will. But what we found out was with the shadow flare, you know, kind of the trim ring, pulled out, you know, via shipment and kind of banging around, I guess, and shipment, it kind of works its way loose and, and comes out above the baffle a little bit. That results in a dip around 1.2 kilohertz, and it goes about 5 dB in magnitude. But if you push the flare all the way in, which is shown in the black, uh, that, that fills that gap right up. And then this blue line is a step, you know, the shadow flare flush with the baffle. So the key takeaway here is that when you get the speaker, you want to make sure that that shadow flare trim ring is pushed all the way in. You don't want to line it flush with the baffle. Its purpose is to be all the way in aligned with the surround of the mid-range cone. So make sure you do that, okay? In-room measurements. Now I'm going to harp on this again like I did in my last video. When you take the anechoic data, you can provide a predicted in-room response, which is what we talked about above. And the question is, how accurate is that prediction? Well, 
it's very, very accurate below the Schroeder frequency, which is where the room becomes purely modal and the room is responsible for the response, then it, it's not very predictive. But above that point, it's very accurate. And what we can see here is in this picture, the placement of the speakers are about uh, one meter or so from the wall. What did I say? 1.2 meters from the wall. And they're four meters from my listening position. And you can see the SVS subwoofer down here that I was testing out with. The, the response that I've measured here is going to be shown with no DSP correction. And it's a spatial average over about one cubic foot. And what we see here in the black is the prediction from the anechoic measurements. And in the teal color is the actual response measured in the seated position. And you can see above about 500 hertz, the response follows very, very well, other than a couple, you know, things here and there, which is typical. It's, a, it's an in-room measurement with a couch, a carpet, a ceiling, a fan, uh, a lamp desk, or a, a desk, I guess, next to me, a table in, end table. There we go, end table. A lamp, you know, real stuff, real room, uh, toys on the floor, dogs running around, whatever, real room, real house, real person. Um, but yeah, I mean, it measures, it measures up really, really well to the prediction. So what you can take away from this is that the prediction works. And if you want to look at measurements as a buying guide, then you can certainly do it. I'm not saying to ever use measurements as a replacement for a purchase. Never do that. Always buy and listen. But to help you narrow down on a sound that you may like or a speaker you may like or prefer a sound or, or anything like that, you can use the in-room prediction. And you can trust that in-room prediction is going to be accurate uh, down to around, you know, three, four, five hundred hertz, which is, again, where the room takes over. And you can see that in these measurements here. This is couch, ceiling dip, floor dip, just that kind of stuff. It's, it's not uncommon at all. Uh, and then parting random thoughts. Uh, if you want to go read that, you can, but it's pretty much everything I've discussed in the video. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it off right here, and then we'll go ahead and end this thing. That's it for me. I hope you guys appreciate it. And uh, like I said, it's going to be long, so if you made it this far, that's pretty awesome of you and kudos. Oh, and in case you're wondering, this is an NSYNC t-shirt. My mom got this for me like two years ago and I wear this thing all the time because I like NSYNC. It's not even a guilty pleasure. We all have guilty pleasures. I don't have guilty pleasures. I just like music that I like. So if you're down with NSYNC or Backstreet Boys or whoever, let me know. Tell me who your favorite boy band member is. Tell me who your favorite boy band is. Whoever it is, let me know what song it is. Any of that stuff. And if you're one of those people who are like, I don't like boy bands because you don't want to seem lame, Dude, come on. Come on over here. It's all good over here. No judgment in this zone. No judgment here. So with that said, I'm out. You guys take care. Bye, bye, bye.